Welcome everyone to Unlocking the Door to Funding SEL, where to find funding for, for social emotional learning initiatives. We're so glad that you could be with us today and I'm excited that we get to spend about an hour um, sharing some information, taking your questions. I'm happy to um, hear your comments, whatever you wanna share with us in the chat box. Um, please do that. I'll be manning that chat box as I'm talking and while our uh, my co-presenter is speaking. So um, we'll try to get to those questions and comments as we go, but we'll definitely save some time at the end. All right, so a lay of the land for our presentation, just so you know what we're planning to cover today. Of course, we'll do some quick introductions. Um, I'll point you in the direction of some funding basics. We'll get into some SEL policy, certainly for the 2021 update, COVID-19 relief funding, the federal budget, budget, some great resources to find that information. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about one grant that we partner with closely in Georgia, and we'll leave you with some really great resources that you can access at any time. So my name is Jennifer Sanderlin. I'm a Senior Education Partnerships Manager with Committee for Children. Um, I've been doing this work for eight years now. Um, prior to that, I was a classroom teacher, after school and early learning program administrator um, for many sites here in the Seattle area where Committee for Children is located. Um, I've been doing this work with schools and districts and organizations, mostly in the southern states. Um, working directly to help with social emotional learning, of course, but also bullying prevention and child abuse prevention efforts. So I'd like to go ahead and um, toss that over to my co-presenter, Jordan. Uh, it's great to have all of you with us here today. Uh, I'm happy to go over all the fun facts of federal funding with you. Real quick, let me just tell you about my background. Uh, I, too, was a public school teacher in New York City turned attorney. Uh, practiced law for several years in California, uh, but have been causing mischief for the better part of my grown-up life, uh, messing with legislation both at the state and federal level, especially as pertains to social-emotional learning uh, in my current role with Committee for Children. And I've got all the latest and greatest information to share with you about what's going on with SEL and Congress. Um, our mission is to foster the safety and well-being of children through social-emotional learning and development. Um, in a moment, I'll just talk a little bit about how we're best known, but one of the biggest bodies of work that we actually do that's sort of behind the scenes, and um, and he would be humble to say so, but our advocacy work with Jordan um, at the helm is um, really pivotal in this field. Um, we advocate at both the state and federal levels for policies and laws that support social emotional learning, prevent bullying, and protect children. Um, our programs and our services um, serve 16 and a half million children in all 50 states. And Jordan's going to tell you a lot about his work in a few minutes, but I just want to make sure he knows that we very much appreciate that work and we know um, how important it is that he help lead that for us. Um, so you do probably know us by our program, Second Step Family of Programs, or really a holistic approach to building supportive communities for every child through social emotional learning. Um, this graphic kind of gives you an idea of how we are really looking at this from a holistic standpoint of really putting the child at the center. Um, the, our programs help build the whole child through SEL competence, preventing bullying, protecting children in school, and we've now expanded beyond the classroom to support out-of-school time and SEL for adults. Um, today's webinar is not about the Second Step program. We won't get into um, any of the nuts and bolts of the program um, today, but we definitely would love for you to explore that. Our website there, secondstep.org slash what is Second Step is a great place to start. Um, we also offer lots of other webinars, so I hope that you would join us for a webinar about any of the particular topics that might be of interest to you. So with that, I'm going to just give a tiny bit of a background. Um, this is, you know, really Jordan's wheelhouse, but I'll just get us started um, by offering one resource that you may not have seen yet or know about at all. Um, we're going to talk today a lot about some of the specific funding um, opportunities there are out there. Um, but if you're interested in a little bit more kind of 
going back a few steps and thinking about the funding basics of how um, grants and funding opportunities work and some of the um, ways that you can maximize that work, please do check out a recorded webinar that we have. And I've put our secondstep.org slash funding grants uh, on there. Our website is where you can find that education funding for SEL, the basics. Both the recording and the slide deck are there for you. So um, I hope you'll take a look at that. In that webinar, we really go through the life cycle of a grant, the funding process, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, in that webinar, they go through identifying, writing, applying, receiving, and reporting, kind of all different um, aspects. It's a really, really engaging webinar. It's short and easy, so I hope that you will take a look at that. For today, we are going to focus on the identifying section. It's really one of the hardest parts, I think, of, I mean, well, there are lots of hard things about running grants and reporting and having them. I'm sure if those of you who joined who are um, grant writers or coordinators could speak to that far more than myself. Um, but today we're going to look at the identifying piece um, of where to start looking for funding, and then um, we'll leave you some resources to do that and then to go forward in the rest of the funding process. So the webinar on the funding basic goes through a lot of detail and Jordan's gonna talk to you about some of these things. Um, these are This is just sort of a look at some of the examples of some of the things you might have seen. So I'm not gonna go through this slide, but really we look at federal, state, local and philanthropy, um, sometimes local and philanthropy are together. Um, but Jordan will identify some of these things for you. And then in that funding basics webinar, um, we'll give you a few more ideas as well. All right, so with that, I'm gonna toss the baton over to Jordan. Um, let me give you the baton, here you go. Thanks again, Jen. Uh before I dive into the wild world of federal funding, I'll just say a little bit about why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, when we talk to schools and school system leaders about their challenges in implementing and advancing social emotional learning, inevitably scarcity of funds is top of list. It's very challenging, we're aware, to build capacity uh, to advance your initiatives, uh, whether it's you know getting your next uh, set of second step materials or otherwise. So. What I've been doing uh, with a lot of our partners and government affairs organizations is working with Congress to make sure that SEL shows up in funding conversations. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, in recent history, you might have learned that we have a, a bit of a challenge f across the country in going through the pandemic as far as uh, teaching and learning is concerned. And we are now entering negotiations for I believe it's our third round of COVID-19 relief funding. But let me talk to you about the one that passed most recently in December, because that is the one that's going to be readily available for your purposes uh, in the present. In the last round of funding, we saw uh, $82 billion dedicated to the Education Stabilization Fund. Now that's three different buckets, two of which are relevant for social emotional learning. You see that I've conveniently squared them, made them orange so that you could find them easily subsequently as we send you this PowerPoint after the show. 54.3 are dedicated to the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, the short version of that is ESSER. So you're gonna hear me talk about ESSER going forward. And 4.1 are meant for uh, the Governor's Emergency Relief Fund. But what's special about both of these is that there's a tremendous amount of flexibility with how these funds can be spent. And explicitly, under ESSER, you can spend on social-emotional learning. Now, for the sake of completion, you'll see that $22.7 billion for higher ed. I mentioned that. I think it is less conducive to supporting SEL. But to the extent there are teacher preparation programs that include SEL, even that might be conducive to supporting social emotional learning as well. There's a bit of a catch for some of you, depending on how large your school system is. Under the ESSER aid, under the ESSER funds, there's a formula for how much you're going to get. And it tends to favor larger districts. This thus has implications for smaller districts. You can see on the right hand side of this slide that uh, there are two California districts here. Both have high levels of poverty, but the smaller district will get fewer dollars under ESSER because the per pupil favors larger districts. 
That means if you're a smaller district, you're going to have to be scrappier with where you shop for your funds because the federal government is going to be regressive as far as your purposes are concerned. I'll also mention, if you're curious about how much you'll get exactly, I recommend you go to the Whiteboard Advisors website where they actually have an interactive tableau wherein you can select your state and go down, pick your district, and that'll list how much you are expected to get under the SRA aid fund in the second round of COVID relief. I'll send you that link later just so you have it handy because I know you can't click on this and go there now. Moving along, you'll notice there are no orange SEL squares here. I mentioned the $7 billion for broadband support, however, because we all know that connectivity is a major issue across schools across the country. And as Committee for Children is moving further and further into the ed tech space, this is relevant for our purposes too. Should you be interested in hanging out with us in the digital space, that's the dollar that'll help you get there. What else is going on outside of education is also relevant to SEL. These grant lists are health and human services related. A lot of you, we've learned, are funding your social emotional learning efforts under the Project AWARE grant. Historically, that grant has been used for student mental health, substance use issues, and because social emotional learning undergirds some of those efforts, we know that it's been effective for a funding source at times. Uh, I'll also just uh, mention the $10 billion for child care and 250 for Head Start. Now, I'll tell you, while those are technically eligible for things like social emotional learning, my anecdotal understanding is those dollars have largely been spent just keeping the lights on in those uh, buildings because it's been very difficult for early learning providers, child care providers to stay afloat during the pandemic. What's happening outside of COVID-19? We have regular budget cycle uh, for federal appropriations. Now, at the end of last year, again, these both happened at the same time. I'm gonna extract them, separate them for you because it's easier to understand, even though they rolled up together and were called the Corona bus when they passed. So 1.4 trillion was appropriated in the last federal budget. And there is a lot conducive to supporting social emotional learning. We know that historically, you'll see the titles that I've listed here, were already eligible for being spent on SEL. What's really interesting is, despite the economic hardships our country is facing, we've seen increases nearly across the board for most of the coffers federally that support SEL, which is an indicator that Congress kind of gets the challenges that students are facing, at least in terms of the need to invest further in teaching and learning. So you'll see, for example, the 40.6 billion for K-12 ed, 16.4 billion has been appropriated under Title I to local education agencies. That's what LEAs stand for, uh, which is up 227 million from last budget cycle. And the list goes down. I don't need to read them for you. You can see it right here. The 12.9 billion, for example, is IDA. That was one of the first coffers that was found to be eligible, eligible to support um, SEL. Uh, well, I'll talk to, uh, I just want to flag the bottom one, though, for further consideration. 21st century community learning centers. And uh, that historically hasn't been a major point of focus. I dare say that could move into further focus as we uh, enter the Biden administration's uh, education agenda. We haven't quite started yet. I'll talk to you about the incoming secretary soon, but he has yet to be formally confirmed. Moving along, there's 40.6 billion in, in K-12 that also speaks to education, innovation, and research. Uh, that continues to go up. Last year was the first time we had historic funds explicitly, exclusively dedicated to researching SEL on the federal level. Uh, you see 30 million in community schools. Let's flag that one for further conversation. And then uh, 106 million, up a tiny little bit, mental health services. I'll bet you that's going to go up next cycle because we understand that uh, students will be coming back to school in the fall with probably more complex mental health challenges than they had in previous years. And I don't need to tell you as to why. Remember how we talked in COVID-19 relief funding that there is money outside of education conducive to supporting SEL? Well, here we are again in the regular budget appropriation cycle under the Department of Health and Human Services. Once again, Project AWARE uh, as an eligible coffer goes up by 5 million. Now, 
Uh, some of you might not be aware of the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative at 72 million this year, up 3 million from the last. But I also think because trauma is an increasing point of focus, not just at the federal level, but also at the state and local levels, that might experience a funding increase as well. I've seen several pieces of legislation floated to further address uh, needs around student trauma. So what's going to happen in the next education administration? Well, Dr. Cardona from Connecticut has already gone through his confirmation hearing, so it's just a matter of time uh, before we see the vote to confirm him into the position. I dare say that's going to happen without significant challenge. And once that happens, it helps to understand what will his administration entail, because even though you see funds appropriated for this or that, the administration does have some flexibility to prioritize what gets spent on. Well, uh, it helps to back up a moment and think, well, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond was uh, the leader of uh, Biden's transition team for education. And so it was probably helpful in, in selecting uh, Dr. Cardona as the candidate to serve as the next secretary of education. Dr. Darling Hammond is interested in issues of equity, uh, professionalizing the educator workforce. Uh, and I also understand that Dr. Cardona particularly is interested in multilingual learners, uh, as Federal calls them, English learners, formerly English language learners. Uh, we'll probably see a lot more effort around that. However, both he and the uh, prospect of incoming Deputy Secretary, Cindy Martin, currently Superintendent of San Diego, are very interesting, I'll say from a political standpoint, in that they haven't been... Uh, staunchly on the reopen all schools right now or keep them all closed right now uh, sides of the so-called argument. Uh, they've been sort of rolling up their sleeves and trying to problem solve how do we get schools safely reopened now or in the future. Uh, so I think a lot will be spent on figuring that equation out as well, uh, which doesn't necessarily translate directly into support for SEL, but we happen to know that both these individuals, Cardona and Martin, have explicitly supported social-emotional learning. So come what may, it seems that we're going to have champions in the department that will support SEL as we move through this in the next several years. What's happening now? Uh, so next round of COVID relief, as I mentioned earlier, rolling. Next round of federal budget cycle appropriations is rolling. And here's where we are. This could be wiped out at the end of the day, but let's just take it for what it is. There are, it's, I'm rounding up to 130 billion, just like an ESSER, currently marked up in the House side. Now remember, there's a House and a Senate, so they've got to hang out together eventually. But the House has taken, it's actually about 129 billion, uh, to the Department of Ed for grants. But here's what's interesting and different in this round of budget appropriations. There is now an increased focus on learning loss, or if you prefer the strength-based alternative is learning recovery. And we got language explicitly to say, when you're doing this learning recovery effort, when you're spending on this, you need to think of social emotional learning front and center so that when kids are expected to regain the academics they would have gotten but for the pandemic, this is the way to help them get there. We can't expect us to return to uh, a normal learning setting unless we invest in um, some of these, uh, we'll, we'll call them uh, readiness to learn matters, and that means social emotional learning. And that's how a lot of Congress has been thinking about it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, Congress is going to have a fight about this and that in funding. But so far as we can tell, we're at a very interesting point federally where Congress isn't really fighting about social emotional learning. They can say it now. They couldn't say it about five years ago. And really, they're going to allow that language to stay off in the corner as they fight about the more controversial things. So we are in a bit of a catbird seat, a sweet spot, where we think our social-emotional learning language will make it to the finish line in the next round so that schools and school systems can now spend on SEL as they address issues of teaching and learning to and through the pandemic. Now, before I hand it out to Jen, I will just mention again, federal is just one place. We know you can get your funds, but there are many other places, as she mentioned earlier, uh, local and philanthropic. That will be a challenge that's much more easy for you to problem solve. However, when we find those opportunities, we will be quick to share them with you. 
but for now, let's focus next on the state level. And now I will hand it back to Jen uh, so she can walk you through uh, some of that. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I know for me, even doing this work, like just kind of understanding how these bills happen, how the language gets in there, it's really complicated um, and there's a lot of different players. So I think that's helpful to know where we're at and what's coming. And I think it looks helpful too. So, um, so thanks for that. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just to kind of give you, um, you know, we see a lot of opportunities that specifically will say SEL, um, and that's that happens. Um, we'll see them connected to other um, initiatives, though. We'll see those words um, sort of embedded in other grants and other um, funding opportunities as well in places that you might not necessarily look or know. Um, so I wanted to just highlight a really um, wonderful grant that has been in development for, this is our seventh year partnering with the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services. Um, and actually this grant um, closes on Friday of this week. So it's not necessarily the best timing to tell you about it in the sense of, for those of you joining from Georgia, you know, hurry up and apply. I mean, you certainly do still have some time if you wanted to. Um, but mostly I wanted to just show you how some of these state agencies might be thinking, how they're partnering with, with the departments of education in some cases, um, and where their priorities overlap and intersect with social emotional learning. Um, so it kind of gives you maybe think a little outside the box um, when you're thinking about social emotional learning. Um, as Jordan said five years ago, a lot of people couldn't say the term social emotional learning and know what it meant. Uh, these days that is less and less true. So we're, we're thankful for that. Um, where the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services um, came into play was really around their mission to strengthen Georgia's families through um, protecting children through from maltreatment, neglect, and abuse. Um, and that's through their prevention and community support section. So if you go to their website and you go to the PCS prevention and community support section, that's where you would find information about this particular funding opportunity. Um, but they're also working a lot of other initiatives, mostly around the protecting children. So some of the impetus for the work that they're doing does come from their state legislation and a real um, effort that they have put forward on their sexual abuse, assault, awareness, and prevention education. Um, that's a real mouthful. Um, it's really their um, answer to Aaron's Law. It encompasses a lot more than that, though. Um, and that became effective in, in July of 2018, where schools were required to provide an annual age-appropriate education for K through 9, um, and also offer annual professional learning for all school staff, those delivering um, the prevention education model. So that legislation, obviously, you know, that kind of, you know, the, those laws happen and some guidance comes out and maybe not a lot of guidance comes out and schools um, and districts are not always sure where to go next or how to, how to embody that actually in their schools and what will make the most sense for the things they're already doing. Um, to make sure that it actually is effective. So they started to look at the long-term prevention. You know, if you're thinking about keeping kids safe as the first and foremost um, goal, the long-term prevention of this is thinking about how can we help raise up kids that will grow up to be adults that would then um, not hurt anyone else, that would grow up to be adults who would be, um, you know, happy, empathetic, problem solvers who are positive communicators who, um, you know, have friends and communicate, you know, well with their, um, their, you know, teachers and just kids that would grow up to be people that would never hurt someone else. So we look at that really long-term um, primary prevention is giving kids those skills. So that's where they landed on social emotional learning as a primary prevention to reduce child maltreatment. And also in an effort, you know, to helping kids right now. So the long term was one look, but helping kids right now was also really important. And I'm sure that's where a lot of you are thinking right now, too. So social emotional learning builds resilience. Um, it is something that can be 
implemented universally through schools um, as delivery systems. A lot of prevention work can sometimes happen in a silo or in a community outreach format um, where you might sort of push into settings. And their idea is that we would take these and bring them into the systems that kids are already in, that kids are already thriving, hopefully, and being served well by professionals and people who care. Um, so schools, kids have to go to school, they need to go to school, and that's a great place we can catch them. Um, it aligns and develops protective factors, which um, I'll just touch on really quickly. And it can really change the culture of schools. Social emotional learning has really been a lever for school climate, for positive um, behavior intervention support. So it fits nicely with um, child abuse fits as something you also want to think about in terms of bullying prevention. Bullying is another type of abuse. And that's the way this prevention team looks at it. So those, those are kind of the main factors that they chose social emotional learning. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, thinking about those schools as delivery systems, um, it's really trying to fit social emotional learning, child abuse prevention and bullying prevention in places where the kids are. They're large and well-established systems. Um, there's resources that are already allocated, both for state and federal, so that would help support the work you might be doing through a grant like this. Um, there's universal access. Um, obviously in the United States and internationally. Um, they're trusted and credible for the most part, um, and they are also generally very empirically oriented to look at research and evidence-based interventions, um, which is how Second Step really rose to the top in this work for them to choose Second Step as a program for this grant. Um, and it's really proven success over time. Um, as I mentioned, this grant is in our seventh year um, and has had positive results um, for each of those years. So they continue to fund it as soon as um, every year, as soon as they know they have the budget. Um, and I anticipate that will happen again for next year. So if you've missed this year's, um, there's still a chance for next year. Hopefully they will have additional funds perhaps for next year, we'll see. Um, so the way the state has gone about doing this is to release a um, grant application. It's released in January of the school year um, for the next year. Um, it's just like most grants where there's a lot of paperwork and things you need to do to check a bunch of different boxes. Um, and I'm going to leave you with some resources of ways that will help you to fill out those statements of need um, applications. Um, generally, they uh, are able to award those based on the quality and the proposal of the budget and certainly how much the schools are asking for. It's open to all school systems and charter schools and organizations that serve schools um, in their community based uh, organizations um, pushing in to help with social emotional learning, bullying prevention and child abuse prevention, of course. Um, and then generally the ordering and training of the resources rolls out in July or August. And then the curriculum is fully funded. It's by reimbursement. So it's a, it's a really, really good grant. Um, it's a solid process. We've sort of worked out the kinks over the years and it is specific to second step. So of course it's a grant. We at Committee for Children and myself on the Education Partnerships team, I'd love to see more and more of these grants um, out there for second step, but more importantly, I'm just proud that we've been able to bring this together as a way to support social emotional learning as a partnership between us and the Department of Family and Children's Services and prevention um, community support. It's been really successful partnership and this, this system and the way that they have released the statement of need and the process is very well organized. I can't say that's true for all the grants I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm sure you've experienced that. So during um, this year in the pandemic, we definitely have seen um, more a need for social emotional learning. Um, the Georgia team knows that and they're um, at the ready and hoping that this grant process, this year's group of applicants will, will be able to fund as many as apply. Um, we'll see, hopefully, cross your fingers, everybody. Um, what they know too, though, and one of the reasons they're really decided to fund again this year and thinking about this from this lens is that digital learning can lead to isolation. It can lead to behavior challenges, a disengagement. As Jordan said too, when we come back to school, 
kids are going to be at a bigger disadvantage, um, you know, far more learning loss than a typical summer would be, and lots of issues that we're going to need to attend to. I don't have to tell you that again, of course. Um, but that's an important piece to the Georgia team. You know, they're thinking about that, thinking ahead, that this may be an issue, not just this coming school year, the rest of this year, school year, but in the future, you know, as we go forward, these are long lasting Im impacts, um, as these, you know, adverse childhood experiences in some cases for, for these students. Um, but SEL offers students those protective factors against some of those risk factors. I mean, this year is full of them far more than ever before um, that we've seen in, in my lifetime, I think, anyway. Um, so those protective factors that they're looking at specifically are parental resilience, concrete support in times of need, social emotional competence of children. So there, I should have put a star on that one, um, but social connections and then knowledge of parenting and child development, trying to help families to know more what their children are capable of and how they're developing and what their challenges might be. So that's kind of one of the areas that is another connection point is looking at those protective factors, looking at frameworks like the Strengthening Families Georgia um, frameworks in your state, looking for the things that might have um, where you're going to be supporting more than one effort. I think that always makes sense when we can combine these things to be more, to be stronger together, um, to strengthen the work that you're already doing, um, especially. So we do get the question a lot of, you know, where can we find funding? How, um, how do we apply? How do we know, um, you know, some of the language, some of the ways that grants work can be complex. And we know not everybody has a grant writer on their team, um, you know, as Jordan said, there's sometimes the, um, the, it is weighted a little bit heavier toward the larger districts for a lot of reasons. And one of them being that there's often not the personnel to actually look for these grants, apply for these grants, report on these grants once you get them. Um, and we know that. So we really want to leave you with some resources that will help you in that process um, and let you know that we are here to help as well. And, you know, I mean, I just want you to know that this work that Jordan does and the work that I do to help with these grants is not about, you know, making sure that you get second step boxes on your shelves or second step license, digital licenses on your computer. It's really trying to take care of the bigger picture of children. And we as an organization and, and really the largest provider and the uh, longest provider of social emotional learning, it's, we feel it's our, you know, our job to help with that. So I want you to take us up on it. So we'll leave you with some resources. Um, Jordan, if you want to pop in and talk about these two, um, I think that would be helpful. And in while you're doing that, I'm going to copy these links really quickly and put them in the chat box for you. Jen gave a really great example of uh, what a state can do and it puts its mind to it in supporting social emotional learning. Uh, we also, of course, have local and, and philanthropic sources uh, at, at the risk of taking a left turn and talking a little bit more about states, we are actually in the middle of uh, legislative sessions. Many states will be running through the duration of the year, but some only run in the first portion. And what we do know is states right now are trying to figure out especially how to support student mental wellness, mental health. And we've talked about that already several times during the webinar. The chances are there's some appropriation in your state's budget cycle that speaks to that. This is Part of, again, what Committee for Children does, we help lift your voices at key times to your state legislature so you can help tell the story about why those funds matter for your kids right now. Uh, and especially if there's something going on in your state and you're looking for a little help on how to organize and make that happen, give me a call, give me an email, and let's talk. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a, a couple of examples that I'm immediately aware of. Uh, Washington State, that's where I live, is going through their budget uh, cycle and we know that social emotional learning will be coming up and prioritized. The question is, will it make it to the finish line? And this is where it's this is this is not a solo enterprise. Committee for Children isn't going to succeed on our own. We have to find others who are also interested in valuing SEL as far as the budget's concerned. So it'll be an effort that all of us can get involved with. I've seen something similar in Indiana. 
There's going to be a, a re-up of an appropriation supportive to student mental wellness, inclusive of social emotional learning. And even in uh, Florida, uh, there's a, a student mental health allocation. And in order to receive that uh, allocation for purposes of school safety, schools have to articulate what are they going to do with social emotional learning. Uh, but the only way those funds stay on the books is if you raise your voice when they're making the decision to include it. So that's that's my little hijack about the need to advocate at key times. Uh, I'll also say that uh, local in philanthropy, while they're harder for us to spot, they I, I, we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, we try to offer some examples on our website, and Jen offered some earlier on the slide. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's hard to find a collated list. So I, I have a request, which is as you find those examples, uh, please do share them with us if you find that it's okay and appropriate to do so, so that we can start sharing out to everyone else what this looks like. And we can have conversations perhaps with other locals as they're trying to figure out, you know, I'd really like to create a request for, for, for proposals on SCL. What would that look like as, as a local uh, source might do? And then we can point you, uh, point them to these other examples. And that's how it works. That's how we create a lovely ecosystem of funding opportunities that get you better to where you want to go. The, this is just to round it out. Uh, we know we're not the only source that you ought to look at for funding. Uh, both RAND and ASCD, it's now a little dated, uh, in 2017 published a comprehensive uh, value analysis of where to shop on federal SEL dollars and otherwise. While it's dated, we know that the Every Student Succeeds Act has not been reauthorized, so they're still valid. They're still uh, totally reasonable for thinking this through. Uh, I would say consult those. Also, look at the Second Step funding page where we've de generated a matrix, which is similarly dated, but just as accurate, that will tell you uh, all the different places beyond what I shared in today's slideshow on where you might consider looking. Uh, and, and sometimes this means being creative, thinking about the health dollars in concert with the education dollars. Sometimes it's thinking about what you want to do with specifically your Title IV-A dollars, if you'd like to dig down, and how Title A works with Title I. Now, I'm trying to keep out of the woods here, but if you need specifics on, say, when do you get these dollars, when does your state education agency have to roll them down? Uh, what can I spend on time-wise? Can I spend from what I did back in July? I have answers to all that. It's too much to go through here, but I'm happy to go over that with you if you need a little more support. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so I'll just walk you through a couple of those resources Jordan mentioned. We left on the slide so that you can um, take a look. We've got them on this slide when you get your um, follow up, you'll be able to click these links that are on here. Just some of the things that we offer that's, a you know, just to reach out to us about grant writing. I'm going to show you a, um, a screenshot of the funding page in just a moment, but I want you to know these links are here. Um, and especially that last one for additional support. If you go ahead and click on that district consultation form, if you are a district level leader and kind of looking at this bigger picture, looking for grants, um, that's one way we could get you to Jordan as well as if you fill that out, we'll get connected to the education partnerships person like myself for your area, and then we'll we'll get you um, tied into Jordan that way as well. Um, and we can help with a lot of different things along the way. So don't be shy, please reach out. And, and like Jordan said, I think a lot of times you all will have your ear to the ground and you'll hear things um, and we might not know about them, but we can certainly help you with them. Um, having, having worked with so many hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of districts um, all the time. So our secondstep.org funding page, um, there's the address again, secondstep.org funding dash grants. Um, what you'll find on here, as Jordan mentioned, is a lot of different um, things around the fund funding information. Some of the things he's, he pointed out today um, are there um, just looking at it from the lens of where can you find the funding? How do you, you know, what what is it for and how do you get there? Um, we also have some funding application resources, including a grant writing toolkit. Um, we've got grant proposal talking points and some resources for specific things you might 
you know, kind of get a little stumble on, you know, maybe some of the assessment questions or alignments to other initiatives and how does your work with social emotional learning and second step in particular um, fit in with those things, some FAQs. This page has had a recent update, but it has some additional updates scheduled. So um, you'll see some changes if you go look at it today, which I hope you will. Um, you'll see some changes in the next week or a few weeks to a couple months as things develop and as we try to enhance that page for you even further. Um, so that's where you'll find also that Education Basics funding webinar that goes in a little bit more detail about some of the grants and some of the um, opportunities in all four of those areas, federal, state, local, and philanthropy. So I hope you'll take a look at that webinar. Um, and that does have the PowerPoint um, slides too. So if you want to share that out with any of your colleagues, those that might be just kind of getting started with grants, I think that would be a great idea. Uh, and then of course, you'll have this follow-up um, as well with the slides and the recording. So I hope you'll share those um, out to your colleagues as well. So I'm going to just open it up and see if we have any questions in the chat box so far. I know it's sort of fast and furious, but um, I like how Jordan gets to the point. It's very, it's easy to understand and we can all just know what we need to do next. So appreciate that. Okay, let's see. I think the only questions that I had come in were around that link that I ended up being able to put in there for the LEAs to look up their um, funding that the states receive. So I put that link in there and I don't see anything else. So um, Jordan, is there anything else you wanted to add in since we do have a few minutes? I'm sure we can always give people a little bit of time back, um, but if there's other things that you wanted to add before we go. Well, if you do want to hang out with us as far as advocacy, advocacy is concerned, there's an easy way to join. Um, you just go to the Committee for Children website, you'll find our advocacy tab, and in there is a sign-up form. And we're very careful with uh, how much time we spend in your inbox as far as these opportunities are. It'll only happen if there's something really important that we're aware of in your state where your voice could really be helpful in advancing something. And the same is true if there's something happening federally. So I think we sent something like two, maybe three action alerts federally last year. It's pretty slight, but it's super important for your lawmakers to hear from you. They don't want to hear from us. They want to hear from you, and we can help you do that. Uh, so that would be the only thing I add. I'm going to learn a lot more in the next month. We're expected to see the budget pass by mid-March uh, because that coincides with um, – uh, money that's otherwise going to run out if they don't pass it. So they're very incented to actually get this to the finish line by, I think it's March 14. And once that happens, we'll know exactly how much is expected. And then the funding will start rolling out. And the next step will be moving from identification down those bullets that Jen shared with you earlier. Okay. I think the only thing, I guess, if you were just starting out, what would be the first thing you would suggest people do if they've never thought about funding before, always just thought their district would need to pay. What, what do you think for a district leader, the first place they should go besides our funding page? <laughs> uh, talk to your CFO. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, the internal, that's sometimes they don't know who to go to within the district. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you're, somebody in, is, is in charge of budget and they're worth talking to. It's also helpful to talk to your district leaders to figure out where does social emotional learning fall on the list of priorities and how will funding be used to support those efforts. Uh, but the other thing is there's somebody at your state education agency, your Department of Education, that is responsible for shepherding federal dollars down to the local level. Whoever that is knows the ins and outs like nobody's business. They are worth a phone call. And they'll probably tell you how the state has interpreted the way the funds will roll. And some of this is a bit of managing up, if I may, where you're going to say, you know, I'd really like to spend on social emotional learning. How do I do that? And they'll probably be the best uh, friendly problem solver to have that conversation with you. I would say that's a good first, second step. That's no great. Intended. I know. I was like, wow, that was really slick, Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's good. I think it is sometimes that's the just knowing who to call. I don't know what those or, or email at this point, I suppose. I don't know what all those titles of those state education agencies 
folks are. I think it probably varies quite a bit. Um, and I have experienced too, just across the board, I've worked in as many as 16 states at one time, and I've experienced quite a difference of how people interpret the rules of funding. Um, you know, I could have a district, you know, districts next door to each other and one say that, nope, we can't use this for SEL and yes, we can. So I think that's sometimes tricky too. So I, th I think your comment about managing up is probably pretty relevant in these situations um, as well. So I don't know if you have anything you can add to that, but it is, it's definitely a phenomenon that I see. Indeed. Uh, I want to mention, Jenny, you've got a question in chat. Oh, yes. Um, oh, I see the question about wanting to know the amount the funding states receive. And I did put that in there already, but I can put that in. Um, and there was a question about our Mind Yeti program. Oh, thank you for that. I know we we love Mind Yeti. Um, and it, the, the question is, when will our mindfulness um, program called Mind Yeti be bought, brought back for subscription? It has been on a purposeful pause, as we like to call it, um, for about the last year or so. Really, we I don't know when it might be back for subscription. We really pivoted to focus all of our energies right after the COVID-19 um, pandemic, you know, really hit and we were all at home. We shifted and we worked really hard to give you a lot of COVID-19 supports. And then um, really also pivoted into putting all of our focus and energy into some new resources for out of school time for SEL for adults and our brand new digital elementary program that's launching in about two ish weeks. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but you do have the 15 free sessions of Mind Yeti on our website. So I hope you'll take a look at that. And for those of you who've never heard of Mind Yeti, I hope you'll go um, to mindyeti.com and you can find those, um, how to get to those 15 free sessions. They help kids from K to five, but they help all of their adults too. So I hope you'll, I hope you'll take a look at that. Thanks for, thanks for asking. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything else that has come through. Um, how do you apply for the ESSER funds? Um, Jordan, they just looked up their district. So how oh. would you apply for that? So the way it works is Congress is going to hand that cash over to your state education agency. Your state education agency is then responsible for subgranting down to local education agencies. So it's going to look like a granting process, but you're entitled those funds, I assume, so long as you abide whatever the state says you need to do to get them. Uh, that process will vary per state, but the time frames won't. So it's just a matter then of figuring out, okay, when do I have to do it? What are my expenditures? And what's the process that's going to be as between the state and the local, the state education agency and the local education agency? That's worth a phone call. And I don't, I can't tell you who in your state agency will be responsible for this. Chances are it'll start with somebody who's probably cabinet level and then roll down into somebody who's in the more bureaucratic administrative level. So it could be the Title IV coordinator. It, it could be somebody who's managing the whole of it, but uh, of budget, but I doubt that. Uh, so this is great variance compounded by, and, and not to wander too far off track, Oftentimes, the ESSER funds will get commingled with the governor's emergency relief bucket in order to do something jointly. For example, uh, if broadbanding is a, it's a major issue everywhere, but if it's a point of focus for your department and for the governor, those dollars can coincide to make sure they get the biggest bang for the buck. So the, uh, the hardest, best advice I can say is get the number to your state ed contact and then burrow through them to the right person at the end of that line. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Ray, for that question. I think that's probably a big question most people have. It is a bit of a, um, uh, what is that word I'm looking for? Sort of a, a journey or <laughs> adventure. Labyrinth. <laughs> if you just try and, I think if you go, if you go into it knowing that it, there's going to be turns and twists and <laughs> maybe that'll help. I don't know. I don't know. Um, that is probably one of the hardest parts is just the levels, the sort of, you know, I'll just say bureaucracy that, that happens. It's a lot of money. I, I do encourage people sometimes that get a little bogged down on writing these grants and the detail that's involved. And trust me when I say that I um, understand that. Uh, but I also remind people that it's a lot of money. And, you know, 
there's just no such thing as a free lunch. So if you kind of go into it knowing it's going to take some effort, um, it, I, it will pay off in the end. So, um, I'm not seeing anything new coming in. Let me just double check the chat box. Okay, thank you. Thank you, lots of thank yous. Okay, well, I think that that's all, unless you have any other words of wisdom for us, Jordan. Um, we can give you back seven minutes of your time today. Um, thank you for joining us. This is really such a pleasure to have our people with us on our webinars um, who understand social emotional learning, who who care about it and are working on it. Um, our job is to support you in that. And so so take us up on our offer and, and get in touch. So I'll leave you with our information of how to call our website. These are our second step. It's sort of the easiest way to get to us. But I did also share the cfchildren.org um, web address in there. And that's where you can go and join Jordan's action alerts and get involved um, locally at your state and, and um, sometimes even at the federal level. Any last words from you, Jordan? Happy hunting. Happy hunting. Find your fun. Good, <laughs> good luck to you. Yes. Good luck. Thank you, Jordan, for your help today. And um, we wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day. We know that this work with social emotional learning wouldn't help happen without you. Our mission doesn't go forward without the hard work that you do. So thank you for that. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, rest of the week and stay well. All right. Bye bye now. <laughs>